Last week, in our study of Ephesians, we considered the fact that we, as God's people, have a calling from God by virtue of our creation. He, God made us and we exist because of him. And our redemption through Christ. He reconciled us to him when he rebelled. We are called, Paul says, to be God's adopted children, his holy family, which is to say his church, whose primary purpose is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And everything finds its place under that great purpose. This is our identity. This is our place in the universe. This is our future hope and our glory as human beings who are made in the image of God. And this calling, this message we bring speaks against the depressing narrative of the secular world that we are nothing more than accidents in a meaningless cosmos, without purpose, without hope. Now this morning, we're going to see that our awesome calling to be God's people and to share God's future comes with serious responsibility. In chapters four through six, Paul moves from mind-stretching cosmic theology to -to down-to-earth application for our life together as his church. In Ephesians chapter four, verse one, Paul writes, therefore, I, a prisoner for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Paul understands our calling as Christians to be a matter of great importance. And so he begs us to live a life worthy of our calling. And this exhortation, this urging has credibility because of his calling by Jesus to be an apostle and by his example as a prisoner for the gospel. So Paul is laying it all out on the table We must lead a life worthy of the gospel. And by worthy, Paul doesn't mean that we must prove that we deserve to be God's people for because we can't prove it and we don't deserve it. He's already made clear that God has saved us by his grace when we believed. We can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. And so by worthy, Paul means that we must live in a manner which is consistent with and expressive of and appropriate to God's gracious calling upon our life. And for Paul, that means one thing above everything else, unity, the unity of love. He writes, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. I smile when I read this because given what Paul has so eloquently written in chapters one through three about God's eternal plan for the cosmos and our favored position in it, we might expect him to end with a grand theological flourish as a finale, like, be your best selves, my fellow favored ones. Instead, he writes, listen to me. I'm serious. You are God's new humanity. You will inherit the earth and you will rule the cosmos. Stop acting like children. Get along with each other. Now, why would Paul write this unless his fellow favored ones were acting like children and not getting along? So I smile when I read this, but I also grimace because the sinfulness of the church is well known. Arrogance, a critical attitude, impatience, love of power, judgmentalism, 
All of these things undermine the life and witness of the local congregation, not to mention to not to mention the church worldwide. So unity is essential. And Paul wants to tell us three things about it in verses 4 through 16. He's going to say unity is of the Spirit, that unity is experienced within diversity, and that unity is required for maturity and growth of the church. First, he says that unity is of the Spirit. We are not called by God to create unity but to maintain it. Christ has already created unity through his death and resurrection and through the giving of his spirit. What remains for us as his church is to implement and maintain this unity among ourselves through the power of the spirit, generation after generation, until Jesus returns to complete the plan to unite everything in heaven and earth under his reign. In this sense, the church is called to be a preview of this coming attraction. The world gets a glimpse when the church is being what Christ wants us to be of what is coming when local churches full of diverse sinful people but who are united with Christ worship together and strive together to maintain the unity of the spirit. And when we are successful, this unity stands out in a world that operates more like a crash car derby. But maintaining unity is hard work, is it not? It's the hard work of love. Unity grows, as Paul indicates in verses 2 to 3, when believers make every effort to live with each other with humility and gentleness and patience with one another, making allowances for each other's faults, and we all have them. This requires of us self-awareness. Am I aware of my own faults? Am I aware of my own speech? Do I have a critical tongue? Am I a gossip? Am I, do, I, do I read things into things? Am I patient with those who annoy me? <laughs> This requires self-awareness and it also requires self-control, especially over what we say, both of which the Holy Spirit will give us when we ask for it, when we work at it, and when we repent of it, when we fail, and we do. Disunity, Paul knows, is always a threat to be aware of in the congregation, but it is even more of a problem in times of change. Pay attention to Paul because North Point is entering a period of change. This summer, we're going through a transitional period which will lead to the search for a permanent pastor. Change is disorienting, especially at the beginning. It's natural for you and for me to feel grief and anxiety. And so you'll want to be careful not to project your fears on others and act out. And so I urge you, I'm starting to sound like Paul. I urge you to trust your session, your session elders, as they guide you through this transition. Believe me, they are worthy of your trust. Pray for them. Be patient with the process because you won't always have all of the information or you won't always have the context of something that you heard from someone who heard from someone else. If you have questions, please ask. The session elders are available to you. Don't try to guess about motives or attribute agendas, but to put your confidence in the Lord who will guide your leaders and this congregation into the good future that he has for you. If you work hard at humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance of each other's faults, as Paul says we should do, then we will experience the unity of the Spirit. 
It's a spirit that comes from God. It's a unity that comes from God through the spirit. Then you'll see, I'm sure of it, as, as Paul promised earlier in Ephesians, that how God is able through his mighty power at work within you to accomplish infinitely more than all you might ask or think. Do you believe that? Yeah. Rely on this. The unity we have in Christ by his spirit is greater than our differences, greater than our sinfulness. Paul notes that there are powerful things that have bound our hearts together. There is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. Draw upon the power of that reality, of the oneness of God in his plan and his way. Now, Paul explains next that the unity of the spirit happens within diversity. And this is what is the wonderful thing about the Christian faith. This has been Paul's prayer, his understanding of God bringing together Jew and Gentile into one body, which is his way of saying of all the diverse and different kinds of people in the world, they can find fellowship and will in the age to come under one Christ, one Lord. Because God has not created a race of clones who look and act and think the same. He's created various skin colors and cultures and textures and flavors and perspectives and beauty and art and music and and ways of being and ways of doing that are wonderful in their diversity. This is God's doing. It's a human race that brings unique gifts and experiences and insights into this universal calling that we have as human beings to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And part of this, and this is what Paul focuses on now, God gives to each one of us who have unique personalities and unique histories and unique human talents. He gives each of us, Paul says, a spiritual gift for the sake of others in the church. And spiritual gifts are those God-given capacities that contribute to the growth and maturity of the church. He says, God has given each one of us a special gift to the generosity of Christ. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Now, these are only a few of the leadership gifts. There are other gifts as well, which Paul identifies in other places. But all of their purposes is the same, to create unity by strengthening the church in its doctrine, in its faith, and in its ministry. Now, since diversity is an idea that is praised by the secular culture, we need to to clarify that in the church, diversity is meant to contribute to unity, to bear witness to the oneness of God, the, uh, the one faith, the one baptism, the one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. The secular idea of diversity, in fact, sometimes ends up contradicting the Christian understanding. It is an emotive term that evokes a vague sense of moral purpose, like something we should believe, but means just the opposite in practice. For example, as some people practice it, words like acceptance and tolerance don't mean acceptance and tolerance if you don't accept and tolerate what they insist that you must accept and tolerate. We know that and we're frustrated by it. In Lewis Carroll's novels, Through the Looking Glass, we encounter the same kind of playing with words in a conversation with Alice and Humpty Dumpty. 
When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, Humpty Dumpty said, which is to be master? That's all. Well, what Mr. Dumpty means is that those in power decide what words mean and even can change the meanings of words that have traditionally had a different meaning. And diversity is one such word. The Christian understanding of diversity adds richness to life because diversity exists under the great affirmation of ultimate unity, the one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism. And so when we in the church, in our diversity of perspectives and opinions, submit ourselves, as Paul lays it out, in humility and gentleness and patience and making allowance for one another's faults, we are always able to find a basis for unity and a motivation to agree together, to forgive and to reconcile with one another, to move forward together in one direction. Without a common transcendent truth to submit to, diversity of opinions ends up just being a perpetual conflict. I remember some years ago during the baseball strike between owners and players, how demands and negotiations between the two dragged on and on without resolution and everybody was frustrated. There was no baseball and the fans were tired of it. And one wise commentator noted as I was listening to sports radio one day that they could not and would not agree to a new contract because the owners and the players did not have a common transcendent value as a basis of compromise. Whether love for the game or respect for fans or just simply basic fairness. All they had was self-interest. It was either win or lose in the negotiations, nothing else. This is diversity without unity. The unity of the Spirit, however, makes the diversity of the church a blessing that enriches instead of destroying. N.T. Wright comments that what matters most is that even with all of the different gifts that Jesus has lavished on the church, it is the same Jesus, the same Lord, who is personally present by the Spirit in each of them. He lives within each member of the body, within you and within me. To keep that in mind is to go some ways towards the other great goals of this passage. This is how to maintain, Wright says, Unity. This is how, above all, we are to live up to the calling that we've received. And so we see that the unity in the church is the unity of the Spirit, and the diversity of spiritual gifts contributes to it. Well, finally, Paul explains that when the diversity of gifts given by the Spirit are functioning in unity, they enable the church to mature, to to grow in its faith, its identity, its mission, to be that preview of the coming attraction of God's eternal plan. So starting in verse 13, Paul writes this. This will continue, now he's referring to the equipping of God's people through the diversity of spiritual gifts. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every <clears throat> wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, 
We, the church, will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He is the one who makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. See, that's what God has in mind for the church on earth. To be healthy and growing and full of love. And that is why this striving in the power of the Spirit with the gifts God's given us in our diversity to maintain unity of purpose and focus and love for one another is so important, especially in times of transition. And I am confident that this will be the case at North Point in these years to come because you already reflect the unity of the Spirit. You already demonstrate a diversity of gifts. You already have a good knowledge of doctrine and you are already a healthy body full of love. And Joy and I have been the beneficiaries of that love. And so have people in this community. So I urge you then to make every effort to preserve these things. These are gifts God has given North Point. They're going to bloom and flourish and impact this community for years to come. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we're so grateful for this gift you've given your church of the Holy Spirit who binds our hearts together and draws us together in love, who empowers us to serve, who enables us to overcome our own sinfulness and to love people we don't like and work together with people with whom we disagree and somehow in the, in the miracle of unity and diversity, be your people. This unity that the world hungers for and that we're troubled by the lack of it when we are at war with each other. So Lord, I pray that you would continue to build this in us, that we would continue to grow and mature to reflect Jesus in our lives so that people will be drawn to him. In Christ's name we pray.